Welcome everyone to join us at this great event organized by um, a lot of co-sponsors. So we'll give you the details about the co-sponsors. I'm Christy Gold, the organizing committee member of this seminar. I would like to kick off today's event by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by indigenous people from the beginning. I want to show my respect for their contributions and recognize the role of trading making what is now Ontario. Hundreds of years after first treaties were signed, we're still, they are still relevant today. We are so grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Now I will pass my torch to Jim Chisholm, who is the event chair of uh, tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Christy. Uh, as you mentioned, there's many sponsors for uh, this meeting. It was initiated uh, with two Toastmasters clubs, engineering-based uh, Toastmasters club clubs, the Toronto Engineering Club of Speakers based at the University of Toronto, and the SCORE TM Bracket Squared uh, club based in uh, Toronto Metropolitan uh, University. And nine other chapters of the PEO uh, have co-sponsored it. The, the lead co-sponsor is the West Toronto chapter. Uh, all the seven chapters of the West uh, Central um, region have co-sponsored the, the seminar as well as the York and East York uh, chapter. And it's part of a series um, of seminars that has been initiated by the two Toastmasters clubs uh, and uh, it's dealing with basically developing engineering leaders. Uh, so today's uh, topic you know about, uh, the second one is engineers as leaders and safeguarding the environment. The third one, designing your leadership recipe. The fourth one, uh, engineers Canada leadership and engagement in DEI and women in engineering. The fifth one, powerful presentations for engineers. And the sixth one, engineers as leaders in safeguarding the environment. Uh, so I hope you can catch uh, some of those seminars as well. I think uh, they should be very interesting. So I would like to um, invite uh, Amanda Daly to come forward in a second to introduce uh, our main speaker, uh, Royden Fraser, the president of the PEO. And Amanda is uh, the president of the Tex Toastmaster Club that I mentioned. She's an engineering graduate in chemistry from McMaster University. And without further ado, Amanda. Thank you very much, Jim. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Royden Fraser. He received his Bachelor's of Applied Science in Engineering Physics at Queen's University and his Master's degree and doctorate in mechanical aerospace engineering from Princeton University. He is a professor in mechanical and mechatronics engineering department at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Frazier supervises the University of Waterloo alternative fuels team, which competes internationally in the advanced vehicle technology competitions. Dr. Frazier's research interests focus on energy systems, alternative fuel and electrified vehicles, vehicle batteries, connected and autonomous vehicles, compressed air energy storage, geothermal energy storage and retrieval, carbon capture and storage, life cycle analysis, energy and exergy analysis, optimization of energy systems, thermoacoustics and thermal remote sensing for precision agricultural and environmental monitoring. Among other recognitions, Dr. Fraser has received the Faculty of Engineering Teaching Award and the Engineering Society Teaching Award, along with the U.S. National Science Foundation Long-Term Faculty Advisor Award, and is a Fellow of Engineers Canada and a recipient of the PEO's Order of Honor. He has been a professional engineer since 1992. As a member of the PEO, he has been an, on the executive of the Grand River Chapter, formerly the Kitchener, Waterloo, and Guelph Cambridge Chapters. Dr. Fraser has been an elected PEO counselor for nine terms and has served on many PEO committees and he is currently the president-elect of the PEO. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Royden Fraser towards a future-looking vision for the PEO, 
towards a future looking vision for the PEO, Dr. Gordon Fraser. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen here. Welcome everyone. And if I can just have confirmation, you see a full screen of the presentation. Um, confirmed. Confirmed? All right, great. Well, hopefully we have a, an enjoyable uh, uh, thoughts um, process today and what I'm going to present. Um, we're going to be future looking towards the future of um, PO, a vision for PO. So towards a future looking vision for PO. Let's get started. So engineering, the great hidden profession, as I like to say, it's the great profession, but I throw the word hidden in there. Um, because people generally don't see it. You look around you, what around you has not involved engineering, right? The air you breathe in your buildings has been engineered. You're, certainly the building materials have been engineered, your vehicles. Essentially engineering is somewhere in almost anything. The food you eat involves engineering, right? So, Whether you appreciate it, whether engineers are appreciated or taken for granted, the hidden idea of it, the key con we are key contributors to the quality of engineering and everyone's safety. And in Canada, we also have the regulation side of things, right? So regulations key to our safety. I'm just uh, going to point that out. And that's where PO comes into the play. All right. So key questions we need to ask is what to regulate and what not to regulate to maintain um, the strong profession of engineering and the safety of the public. And one thing we can ask is where is the future of engineering regulation Head it. And when I listened to the future topics in this series, I could see in every one of those topics the future of engineering being discussed. Okay. How are we going to help with the environment, for example? What opportunities and obstacles, however, lay before us? And that's one of the things I'm going to present, some examples. And where we're going to head is in the end, I want everyone thinking about what would be a vision for PEO. And I'm going to encourage everyone who has a good idea to actually submit it. So that's where we're headed. There's a to-do for you in this, an action item. But let's get started. Challenges facing engineering, right? Thinking about the future. And I pulled these off of two sources. You can go onto the web and you type in challenges facing engineering, you can find a lot. I like these two um, because they they basically reverberated and resonated with uh, my thinking. Um, and then the top of virtually every list though you find is the climate crisis or climate change. So we have the source here, the new engineer, climate crisis, providing enough food, that's engineering, improving healthcare. Um, there's one thing about the doctors and nurses deliver healthcare and they do research in the healthcare. But when you actually have to start mass producing medicines and you actually have the equipment that goes into um, critical care units, those are engineered. So improving the healthcare is engineering a problem. Cybersecurity, a big one. Uh, that's uh, your privacy um, side of things. Clean, accessible water. Uh, that's a huge one around the world. Relevant education, I thought that was an interesting one in this particular list, but this is just really saying, do we have enough people who are educating in the right areas to provide us with the skill sets that we need for the future? Uh, the refugee crisis, that does involve engineering. It might You might not imagine it does, but how are you going to handle the refugees? Um, how are you going to have them live in, um, Sanit sanitable uh, conditions, et cetera, engineering. And then enlisting the youth. We always have to think about where 
the youth can be involved because without an ongoing um, feed into the train of engineers, um, the profession uh, will not be strong in the future. But fortunately, we have those strong feeds at the moment. Now, another source, and this is a commercial company. The first one um, was more of an information provider. Uh, climate change, skill shortage, project management, efficiency, gender diversity. These are more um, application focused to a company wanting to do good engineering for the future. And the one I'm going to focus on, these are I could pick on any of these. But to be thinking about the future and the role of PO, I'm going to just focus on technological advancement because that's the one most people think of when they think about the future. They know technology has changed, it continues to change, and I'm going to talk to that one. So if we're going to talk about engineering and the technology changes, um, one thing I'd like to start with, though, is what is engineering? Because we're going to have to decide when we look at the technology, decide what's engineering and what's not. So at the beginning, we have basically engine and ingenious have their Latin root in engineer, uh, which means to create. And then from that, we had in the wars, we had the makers of war engines, and they were referred to as ingenars, which you really meant engineers, which very quickly turned into engineers. So in the 1600s, we have the engineer, and it took on the more general, more civic sense of referring to an inventor and a designer. And if you ask people, uh, engineers today, what do engineers do? There's two common answers. They either solve problems or they design. Beyond that, you don't get many common answers. Okay, So there we are. That's back in the 1600s that was already there. So now I'm going to take a look at the Industrial Revolution, because this is very relevant to engineering. You have uh, the first Industrial Revolution with mechanization, steam power, water power, from the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s. And what was interesting about the Industrial Revolution, it was one major change, but there's also a second major change at the same time. And that is that science became more reliable. This idea of scientific method came into thinking and into the work. So you combine the scientific method with the Industrial Revolution. And that moves us into the second Industrial Revolution, which is mass production and electricity, primarily, uh, from about the mid-1800s to about 1930. And I mentioned this idea of bringing science in, the idea of engineering. So you have engineers, but then you have engineering. And that's where you have, in June 14th of 1922, the Association of Professional Engineers of Ontario being formed, right? Because we can take this science, we can take this training to do engineering in the safeguarding of the public interest. Now, in 2000, the Association of Professional Engineers Ontario was rebranded Professional Engineers Ontario. Why this happened, um, marketing, advertising reasons, future vision reasons. Okay. So again, you have this idea of a future vision with that change to professional engineers Ontario, but exactly what was it? Okay, we'll come up to that in a little later in the presentation. I just wanna move on to the next industrial revolution because we wanna think about the future. So let's see how we got here. So now engineering started entering the third industrial revolution where you had automation, robotics. Every If you talked robotics, that was engineering. Robotics is always engineering. You didn't put it in the, the science departments. You didn't put it in the math departments. It was put in the engineering departments. And then you had IT systems. Now those blended more into the math departments. So you start seeing a shift away from uh, basically materials and energy systems into information systems in the third. Now from 2000, I like to, from 1930 to 2000, I, I like to call this the rise of the computers, right? That's essentially what happened. But what happened after that? Well, computers were here. And what we started doing was using them more and more powerful. And that's where from 2000 to present, we have machine learning, cloud computing, cyber physical systems, a concern for cybersecurity, 
all right? And that's where we are now. And now that's even more information, more away from the materials, more away from the energy systems where engineering formed in the second, where we formed the Association of Professional Engineers in the second industrial revolution about 100, 101 years ago. And if we like to take a look at the industrial revolution, ChatGPT, I'm gonna assume most are familiar with it, but just in case you're not, it's essentially a machine learning um, language model. And it's designed to understand natural language as we write, as we speak. And from that natural language understanding, it can generate human-like responses written and in speech. It also does images, but I'll just talk about the speech side of things and the written. Now, it came out in November 2022, less than a year ago. And we talk about technology change and the impacts it can have. Well, this had an enormous impact. In less than three weeks, it had an impact on the education system. Many methods of evaluating and assessing uh, students became obsolete in essays, computer code, and the like. And they had people, uh, professors and teachers had to find other ways of assessing. Not all did, and it shows um, in some of the marks that would have been received um, during this transition, but it's very fast. So in less than a few weeks, and now in 11 months, approximately, We've seen a great change. It's made traditional assessment tools and methods of academics irrelevant, right? Obsolete. It has also had other applications. You see this in the writers and um, actor strikes. It has the ability to write movie scripts, TV show scripts. These two rough drafts get a lot of the work done. The image side of things has the ability to replace actors. It has the ability to do voice synthesis, 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 right? So lots of concerns. Now, where are we headed? Engineering has to think about this, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is, before I go in the beyond today, 2023, I wanna look at the where we started and where we are now. So we started in 1922, with five disciplines, civil, mechanical, electrical, chemical, and mining. And for a good number of years, those were the only disciplines. But then more became added. And currently in Canada and Canadian universities, we have over 70 different departments, or you could say programs or disciplines or specializations. And even within each, of these specializations, mechanical engineering, for example, which, which I'm in mechanical mechatronics, but mechanical engineering alone in my university has five sub-disciplines of automation, robotics, thermal fluids, machine design, and materials, right, side of things. So there's an enormous breadth increase in what we consider to be engineering from the original five. So now let's take a look at the fifth industrial revolution. And the fifth industrial revolution, as it started yet, uh, there's debate on that, but there's clearly people believe it will involve artificial intelligence. It depends when it reaches the level that's considered the fifth industrial revolution versus machine learning, which is more of a correlator. Um, fusion energy, renewable energy might reach critical points. Um, when does this occur? What we have here, though, is a continuation of information being important and materials and um, energy being important, All right? So let's just look back. So we had the Industrial Revolution. Engineering really grew out of the Industrial Revolution and this ability to have reliable science methods, right? And that's why the science moved into engineering. And it, it's been good for us. I mean, the Industrial Revolution has made things and materials affordable and accessible. 
It's uh, helped with the rapid evolution of labor savings. Um, it's helped with the rapid evolution of medical advances, right? I mean, the speed at which we got the COVID vaccine out there, there's a lot of engineering in that, right? It's improved our quality of life, you know, essentially. Right? And it's provided the specialist professions that allows us to continue that. Now, it's not all good. And this is something we have to think about the future too. There is some bad that comes with it. And by the way, I used the Britannica as my, where I got these examples. So this is not an original list on any of these accounts, but city overcrowding, people moving into the cities from the rural areas, pollution, we're all aware of pollution increasing in attempts of pushing it down and that, unprecedented environmental degradation, many examples around us, Hopefully I don't have to give you examples. Unhealthy habits. This is, was an interesting one, but this is essentially once you start offloading the manual work, uh, people get more desk jobs. They get maybe a little more relaxation time. Um, their eating habits change, their, uh, their activity levels change. Um, colonization was certainly allowed by the power of industrialization mass productions of weapons and that provide for it, for example. And at times there was massive improvement, uh, massive unemployment in the industrial revolutions, right? And then when you remove jobs, people become unemployed and are they trainable? And that concerns coming around again with AI. How are we gonna retrain people when the jobs removed? What's gonna happen again to the actors and writers of the world, for example? All right, so that's a bit of history and a little future looking. So now let's take a particular look at PO as a regulator, and it's gonna be similar across the country for other regulators. Um, PO has a mission statement, and it, a mission statement essentially provides your core values and purpose, and PO's mission statement comes from its act. It's to regulate the practice of professional engineering in order that the public interest may be served and protected. So I will note that the public interest being served and protected is the core value. We're gonna protect the public interest. And the purpose is to regulate, right? We're not operating businesses, we're gonna regulate. So the mission statement is pretty well fixed by the act and it tends to be agreed upon. I've never heard anyone actually disputing the mission statement, okay? In contrast, however, a vision, and I'm just going to have us today focus on, think of vision statement. How would you put into words your vision for PEO of the future? And a vision isn't about the core values and purpose. It has to encompass that. But it's about your goals, where you're going to go, and your ambitions, how far you're going to go. Right? It provides direction to the mission. So to give an example that I think is a very simple and clear one to get you thinking about a vision statement and a vision for PO. And so I'm taking this whole vision and to, for today's talk, I'm focusing it down to just a vision statement for you to think about, all right? Not the whole vision, just the vision statement. And I'm particularly um, fond of GM's uh, recent one. There's other good. There's a lot of good ones out there by companies. They have a mission statement, but they also have a vision statement. And let me show you their vision statement. And I'll read it out. Zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion. Now, this has all the elements, I think, of a good vision statement. I, first off, it communicates the values that they want to communicate. They want you to communicate that their vehicles are safe. They want to communicate that they're providing for a healthy environment. They want to communicate that the travel will be convenient. I have not heard anyone say, I want more crashes or a less safe car, or anyone say, I would like more emissions because I want to breathe uh, polluted air, or um, I really like traffic congestion today. I'm looking forward to that 50-minute uh, drive home. It does not, it really grabs, it gives you the core values but with a message, and the message is given in a way that it's goal-oriented. These are goals. Remember, the vision is about goals and ambitions. 
these are also ambitious goals, right? Because are we ever going to get zero crashes? We all know there's things fail. Zero emissions, it's hard to imagine. Zero congestion, well, as soon as you have two people on the road, there's always a random chance they can, can have some congestion. So yes, they're somewhat impossible, but you can get really close to them, hopefully. And the interesting thing is it also has wide acceptance, and that's important. A vision needs to have wide acceptance for longevity. It needs to have wide acceptance for the vision to actually follow, to actually start getting close to these targets, because these are ambitious, right? So that I'm just giving this as an example. It's, I, it's not um, in any way I'm suggesting a vision looks like that for PO, okay? Other than it has a goal, as ambitions, and it's accepted by a large number. Now, here is PO's current vision statement. This is it. The trusted leader in professional regulation, self-regulation. Now, it seems pretty good, maybe, to some, and to others, who knows? But I'm going to look at this through the vision lens of what a vision statement is. Well, it offers no guidance on how to achieve this goal. The previous one I showed you did. It's hard to tell if it's ambitious or audacious because do you find this inspiring or just a statement of fact? And how would you measure it? Are you inspired by it? Maybe you are. And is wide acceptance of this? That's actually in doubt because it doesn't have the goal, right? Without Because I've heard people give different goals and hence it gets debatable. So the wide acceptance is in question. So... Because of this, last year, PO took it upon itself to create a strategic plan. And within that strategic plan, it created PO's strategic vision goal. And the goal is to refresh PO's vision to ensure all stakeholders see relevance and value in PEO. Now, to me, the refreshing of PO's vision, that's not the important part of the strategic goal. The important part is that it has the objective of relevance and value. That's a goal. And all stakeholders, that's the acceptance part, right? And when you start thinking about the goal, that's where we can add the ambition in, right? When we actually come up with a statement. Okay. So let's take a look at a little bit of history of PO's vision statements. We might learn something from that as we think about what future vision for PO might hold. So I, there's a lot of writing here. I'm going to walk through it slowly in a moment. Um, but essentially, we have from 1993 to now, we've had four vision statements. And then in 2023 to 2025, Council decided that the vision statement will not be included um, and approved, but we will have this work towards a vision statement for 2025. So we sort of quit the vision of 2015 to 2022 on hold. So let's start with the first vision statement. Okay. And what I've done here is I've just highlighted in red what I think are key parts. So I'll read it out. Members of the profession have the responsibility guided by professional engineering ethical standards to maintain their competence in technical and knowledge skills, as well as skills in communications, organization, and management through a continuous effort of professional development that anticipates and meets the changing needs of society. At the time, this was considered quite good, but it was also seen as quite long. So, Given we have potentially a good one, it has responsibility, ethics, and competence. You know, those are goals. Um, it's looking to the future, it anticipates future changes, and it has this core value of the needs of society. All right, but it was decided by council that there would be a change, and so they shortened it. So the next one reads, Professional Engineers Ontario strives to meet the needs of Ontario society by licensing and regulating the entire practice of professional engineering in an open, transparent, inclusive manner. Now, it still has the core value of meeting the needs. The entire practice 
That's an interesting one because that's part of a vision. Who do you regulate? So this is really a big open tent type of perspective, right? And open, transparent, and inclusive. Well, the open, transparent, and inclusive, the sense I get from it is that there's a trying to build trust. Those are things you usually say when you're trying to build trust. And the entire practice, if you're going to emphasize that, that suggests something maybe is missing, right? So just something to think about. The third one is, again, shortened to try to get more towards this, you know, something you could maybe give an elevator um, pitch of. The global leader in self-regulation that improves the quality of life for all. So now maybe the word self-regulation was in question, what it meant. It is trying to be audacious here. This is ambitious. It wants to be a global leader. And it still has a core value of quality of life for all, right? So as opposed to needs, it's refined it to something more that you can envision. Then finally, we get to the current day one, the trusted leader in professional self-regulation. This is the only one that was not approved by council. It was just a change done um, to try to match the change uh, within council itself. All right. So I'll just leave that as background information. I spent a long time on that, but this shows you there's a lot of efforts, but there was workshops spent on these vision statements. There was a lot of people involved in them. Do, they, do any of them ring true for you? Do any of them are really good? Do they have that crispness of that GM one maybe I showed you? Do they involve everything you think should be in a vision statement? So with those vision statements, what inspired you? Were you inspired by any of these PO vision statements of the past and present. Okay. If yes, what inspires you? Those things should probably be kept. If no, why not? What was missing? What was wrong with them? All right. These are questions that need to be asked. And I think there's people that will answer yes and no to this particular question. Okay. So now we think about regulation. So that's one issue. We got the um, who we're going to regulate, our core values, we want to express them in the vision statement. We also have to realize that PO operates um, in the realm of regulation and hence in the realm of government. And one of the challenges facing engineering regulation today, which is relatively recent, is a bigger interest of governments in the regulated profession. So this has to be considered. What's that going to mean for the future, what type of visions are going to be practical, realistic, or should we have? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? So why do governments get involved in regulated professions? Well, they can be seen as imposing barriers to economic activity. Economics is very important to most governments, right? You can think of the, I'm going to say this is a stereotype. Sorry about the stereotype here, but I'm trying to just get an image across quickly. Think of the immigrant engineer driving a cab, not practicing their profession, right? Recently, FARPACTA in Ontario, the Fair Access to the Professions Act, um, got rid of Canadian experience, which would be one of those barriers to um, immigrant engineers getting licensed, a, a major barrier to some who couldn't get their Canadian experience. And so that scenario would go away. That's why they would come in and interfere. Um, Right, and you have an interest. They could be seen as not the, the governments could uh, see the, the regulators as not being sufficiently addressing public safety concerns. And I would argue this is maybe what inspired the big change in um, in uh, BC with the uh, condo fiasco and the Montpali tailings pond breaches. Those two big events caused some major concern. Um, Right. And then it can be seen as restricting the supply of needed qualified personnel. And we can just think about doctor shortages. Right. How do you alleviate them? Do you educate more? Do you get people to come in licensed? What do you do? Right. And so just uh, this is just the same uh, things listed, but just telling you what happened. So in British Columbia, what they did in reaction is in 2022, they brought in the Professional Governance Act. It's an umbrella piece of legislation where engineers, geoscience, foresters, applied biologists, agri 
technologists, applied science technologists and technicians and architects are now, they have their separate organizations, but there's an umbrella organization above them. This changes self-regulation paradigm significantly, right? Then in Ontario, July 1st, 2023, uh, it was required and it was actually implemented in May, but this year, but by July 1st, we needed to make changes to remove Canadian experience requirements. So we, Ontario brought in the competency-based assessment and the maximum six month timeline and licensure came in uh, for licensing decisions for 90% of the applicants. So PO brought in a new admissions process to accommodate that. So speed became important, right? Speed and barriers. I, I probably should have put an icon up here of a of a barrier of some sort too. So two things there. And now in Alberta, if you haven't heard, there's a dispute with about the title software engineering. And this has to do with where's the boundary between what you regulate and what you don't regulate, okay? And the protection of the public. So just to give some, plant some seeds of questions for you. So these are just really teasers at the moment. Is increased government intervention and in self-regulation of engineering a concern? Yes or no? Or is it a welcomed evolutionary step in self-regulation? Again, it has to do with the vision of the future might influence your answer to that two questions. And given that, how can you answer these questions without a vision, right? If you don't have a vision of what self-regulation looks like, how can you even answer a question about whether it's good or bad for self-regulation? So you need a vision. So where do we go from here? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that this strategic goal of PO to refresh PO's vision um, does have a plan, has a development plan. It started off and was kicked off with the council workshop in, at the beginning of June in the spring. And at that workshop, uh, counselors, entrepreneurs, students uh, were all brought together and we worked through, uh, essentially, I guess you'd call it an understanding and brainstorming session. No solutions, no visions were come, come up with. That wasn't the goal. The goal was simply to understand what were people's thoughts about the present, the current visions, where we should be headed, and the like. So it was really just getting thoughts on paper, some of which I will present uh, tonight. Uh, we then have um, the working group and plus a consultant. You can think of this as the group that's going to manage the development of the um, vision statement for professional engineers Ontario. The, vision, the working group is small and the consultants are the ones that are going to manage things such as the website, communication, setting up meetings, um, and all that. All right. And then the important part. And this is uh, right now, The this will be kicking off on October 10th. We have advisory working groups. And we had in a call in July, June and July, for volunteers to help with the vision work. We had over 100 volunteers um, put their name forward. And we're going to break those up into smaller groups. We can't work with 100 in one room at a time. And we're going to follow the experience-based design method, which is essentially where you rapidly come up with ideas, you test them, you come up with ideas, you test them. Um, fail off, fail quickly is the way software engineers uh, would say, uh, say it. Fail often, fail quickly for success. And that's what we're going to do here. It's not that we're going to fail, but essentially you're going to refine the understanding and ideas. And these working groups will be helping us with this. We'll also be engaging other stakeholders beyond the volunteer members that are going to be our action group developing the vision statement. So let me step back to the vision, uh, advisory working group. The concept here is council is not going to come up with the vision statement. Staff is not going to come up, but PO is not going to come up with a vision statement. Primarily, the working groups are going to come up with the vision statement through an iterative process of involving stakeholders, council, staff, but also um, OSPE representatives, Engineers Canada representatives, student representatives, um, on uh, the um, OSET, our technologists and technician representatives, emerging discipline representatives who aren't licensed, right? 
we're going to involve a lot of government representatives, lots of representatives, stakeholders. And, and this vision statement has to be agreeable, acceptable to the large fraction of the stakeholders. So it's going to be interesting to see where this leads. And in the winter of 2024, is more testing of the vision statements because I expect after about three months of work, we'll be down to a few basic understandings of core goals, core ambitions, and there'll be permutations of those and they'll be tested and developed again with the stakeholders. And the idea is that by uh, the AGM, we should be having a recommended vision statement with a maximum buy-in that would be reasonable possible. My hopes is that there might even be a referendum on the vision statement if there happens to be a choice between two. Um, so anyway, let's continue. That's the process. So we have something in place. Let's get you thinking back again today. Today, we want you to be thinking about a vision. And I, this goes to the workshop. And the council workshop came up with some emerging themes. Um, and these are just really summaries of them. License, and I'll give a more detail on individual slides in a moment. I'll just state them here. Initially, license value versus no license value. When does that occur? Big tent versus small tent. That's essentially how many people need a license or should be licensed. Public safety for public interest. This has to do with, um, is there more to public interest than public safety? We have the licenses. When's it required? When is no license required? Getting that boundary. And then the self-regulation versus government mandate, right? How much government um, involvement versus how much self-regulation should there be? All right, so let's take a look at these one at a time. In brief, I'm just planting seeds here today. So this license value versus no license value. Well, we can kind of see it here in these graphs potentially. So what I've plotted here are two graphs. The first one on the left is our Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board graduates. There's basically graduates from all the engineering schools in Canada uh, that are accredited. There's always one or two that are in the process of being accredited, but you can think of this as being all of them in 2020. So this is the most recent data, okay? And we have to look, uh, the number that are graduated is um, 18,000 in Canada, 18,185, and the number of licenses is 5,764. And then we have, in percentage, remember the left-hand axis is percentage. We have the same percentage difference between graduated and unlicensing. And you see the number of licenses are between 20 and 30% of our graduates are being licensed. All right. Now, that means a lot of engineers are either not, don't see a value in licensing or their jobs don't require it or something's going on there potentially. Furthermore, if I take a look at the 30 disciplines that PO directly recognizes, it recognizes all the disciplines, 70 plus that I showed you on the previous slide, but the ones that they explicitly recognize for uh, the ease of admission process, where they can identify your different areas of knowledge, um, eight of them form 92% of the professional engineers in Ontario. And that's your civil, structural, building, environment, mechanical, electrical, chemical, mining, materials, industrial engineering. The big five that we started with and then a few extras. The other 22 disciplines, including my discipline of engineering physics, falls into the 8%. So where's the value in licensing to those 22 other disciplines? Are they seeing it? Should they see it? There's your vision. Should they see it? Is this a concern? Not a concern. So the license value versus no license value. What is it? And can it be, a can the license be, what is the value of the license? And what can be the value of the license for the PN? What's the value to someone in an emerging discipline? What constitutes an emerging discipline? Is software still emerging? It's a low representation. It's relatively new. Is cybersecurity a new dis discipline? Well, that's a lot in the math area. What about autonomous vehicles and machine learning? Machine learning, that's a lot in the math department, not in the engineer or faculty, not in the engineering faculty. Do we have to broaden our idea of what engineering is? Or 
does it take other regulators instead of professional engineers? And do we have to have new regulators or do we even need regulators at all for those technologies, right? Um, is anyone concerned about autonomous vehicles on the road with no driver and any safety and ethical concerns? They have to make ethical decisions, right? Uh, what about entrepreneurs? This is an interesting one. Entrepreneurs, do they see value? Well, in general, most entrepreneurs, uh, engineering students who become entrepreneurs are not licensed. Uh, when they start up a business, the first four years, three to four years is usually considered the valley of death. Uh, they're just trying to get their business off the ground. Uh, to go in and say you must hire a professional engineer, which is going to cost big bucks, might not be within their capabilities. And if you prevent engineer on these entrepreneurs from developing new companies, and a lot of our startups in Canada are engineering in origin, um, what do you do to the economy? So then what becomes in the public interest, right? So again, what's the vision? These, these causes some things to think about. And then we have the unregulated industries. I call the unregulated industries the ones for which there are not demand side regulation. So when you have demand side regulation, building code, pressure vessel codes, right? You know, uh, health and safety, very health and safety codes. When you have codes, you're regulated. But if you're in an industry that's not regulated, what do you do, right? What's the situation, okay? And this leads into the big tent versus small tent, which was another one of the um, sort of, where's the vision, big tent, small tent? Yeah, so should we regulate emerging disciplines? Should we regulate entrepreneurs? And if your answer is yes, how and when? And so. This is the big tent. If you say yes, we should have this broader licensing, um, your big tent in terms of uh, the logo. If you say we only license those with demand side legislation, which is the large number that we basically license today in the, in the traditional and a few other disciplines, then you're more in the small tent. Or where's that divide? I, I'm using large contrasts here, right? There's a dividing line somewhere. Where is it? Then you have this public safety for public interest one. Now, this is really interesting because both of these statements here come from the Professional Engineers Act. The practice of professional engineering concerns the safeguarding of life, health, property, economic interests, the public welfare, or the environment, or the managing of any such act. So the word safe is at the beginning of everything. And that's the definition of professional engineering or uh, the practice of professional engineering in the act. But then you have the object or objective of the act is to protect in order that the public interest may be served and protected. So now the question is, what's the profession? What's the professional engineering? Is, is the interest greater than just safeguarding? But professional engineering is only safeguarding. So you can see why this confusion. Some clarity may be in order here in a vision. Where's the focus? How much emphasis? Right? I, I, I can't resolve these questions. These questions all have to be resolved as a collective. What would the license required versus no license required? Well, the first thing is engineering is a sliding scale. We've got engineering technicians, then engineering technologists, and then engineers. And then we have engineers who practice professional engineering, and then those who are licensed who do not practice. So it's a very much a sliding scale. So where does that slide end up? When do we cross the boundary for requiring a professional engineer's license, a PNG? So I'm going to return here. This is the entire definition in the act of the practice of professional engineering. It means any act of planning, designing, composing, evaluating, advising, reporting, directing, or supervising. That's a mouthful. That requires the application of engineering principles. Those are a little easier to define, but it's still a circular definition. And then, and concerns the safeguarding of, and I just read this, of life, health, property, economic interests, public welfare, or the environment, or the management act thereof. When you look at this definition, it's all-encompassing. 
I, and I underline the word any. Because what's not here in my view, so now I am going to give you a personal opinion on this one, is the idea of responsibility. So I'm just planting a seed. PNGs, when you put a stamp on something, are taking responsibility. Responsibility has not been put into here. There's a requirement that if you do this, you have to be licensed. That's what the act says. The taking of responsibility. All right, so I'm just planting a seed. That This is quite all-encompassing. So that's kind of a big tent vision, but it's almost too encompassing. Where's the boundary? And now the another one of these sort of splits that were brought up at this uh, council workshop was this sort of, and, and again, I'm doing the diametric here. There's always, balance points always probably in the middle for all of these. We have the self-regulated versus the government mandated. Well, the government mandated would say, do no more than the act says. You're mandated to do it, just do that. No more. Not that you can't do more, just don't do any more. Right? And that's what essentially we do today at PO. And so we regulate and govern. Those are specified actually right within the object of the act to regulate and govern. And then we have things like chapters. And so what we did with chapters is council put them in this category called other. Because it wasn't, I mean, chapters are there, but they didn't fit into the regulator govern part of the object, but the act says we're supposed to do. Then on the other hand, so this is just the other extreme, you have a self-regulated side that has high member involvement. There's different types of self-regulation, but let's take the high member involvement self-regulation. And this might be a future vision. Again, you still got to regulate and govern, right? You still have that mission statement. That's not going to change. Um, but maybe you throw in the idea of profession strengthening, right? So chapters can be part of profession strengthening. Cooperation with OSPEs can become part of profession strengthening, right? Communication with the public of the value of engineering becomes, the communication side becomes profession strengthening. Just a consideration, tossing it out there, just to show you two, two things that were sort of discussed at the, right? So that came from, a long day workshop. We only have 45 minutes here for me to present. So there's a lot of material thinking that you could be doing with what I'm presenting. So what does the your, I'm, I'm almost at the end here. What does your 2050 vision for the future of engineering look like? Right? You got, hopefully you got something in your head or maybe you're drawing a blank. I don't know, right? Well, if you can succinctly state it in a vision statement, right? Please send it to me, and I'm going to forward it to our consultants to compile, all right? With, don't just give me the statement. Give me some brief rationale. Remember that GM statement I put beside it? You know, communicates safety, communicates health. Give me some rationale for it so others can understand it. It may be self-explanatory in your mind, but my experience is none of these statements are actually self-explanatory without an interpreted document and interpretation to go with it. Okay. So I invite you to do that. I only have two more slides. The next one here, you may want to take note of this website at the top. Uh, this website has just become active. This is the website going to be used by the group and the advisory group. You can see there's going to be a special um, page there for the advisory group members. Um, and the home page is going to be for general information. Right now, there's just information that's telling you about the vision and it's going to be engaged. This is the first part of the page, right? It's a design process. It's going to follow the user design principle of this, you know, iterations on ideas. It's going to seek to involve stakeholders that I mentioned. Members are going to look for participation in a transparent way. There will be opportunities for members who are not on the advisory group to participate. Keep an eye on the website for that. Right? So that's the way forward. The way forward is not for me or any one person to tell you what the vision looks like. It is for everyone to think about and people who have ideas to give suggestions and then for us to consider those suggestions as a whole. And from that whole, hopefully we have a common, widely accepted 
ambitious, goal-oriented vision result for PO that we just all can accept. So whatever the future holds, wherever this goes, we can be sure that engineers will be there helping. That's the positive of whatever happens here. So I thank you. Um, if there was going to be quite, I don't believe we're going to have questions. I think we're moving on to a different segment. But if there were questions at the end, I will hang around. And I place at the bottom again on this final slide, my email and that website. And that website will eventually have a link where you can also submit suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy and Fraser. We are so honored to have you. Um, we will have Darren to moderate our next session about the table topics. Um, Darren, would you like to take the take the torch? Yes, thank you, Christy. Good evening, fellow engineers, friends and guests. Thank you, Dr. Fraser, for a great presentation. We've just spent the last 45 minutes or so listening to you talk. Now in this segment of the meeting, it's gonna be the other engineers turn to speak. So in Toastmasters, yes, in Toastmasters, we have something called table topics. And what that is, is impromptu speaking. And you may think to yourself, well, as an engineer, what does that matter to me? Well, I can give you a couple of reasons right now. Ever go to a job interview? Ever gone to a networking event? Ever been trapped in an elevator with somebody? Impromptu speaking has a lot of good benefits to not just your engineering career, but your, to your life in general. So here's how it's gonna work for this game of table topics we're playing. I've got questions based on leadership. Dr. Fraser was talking about leadership today. I've got some nice generic questions that I would like to ask different members of the audience. And I would love to get your input. So I would like someone to volunteer and then I will read you the question. Who's feeling adventurous? Okay, you know what? I'm gonna pick somebody. Afshin, you're an engineer and you're also a leader. I've got a question for you. So up to two minutes, Louise, on the timer, please. Afshin, can you name a business leader who inspires you? And can you tell us why this business leader inspires you? Did you get that option? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, thank you very much, Dr. Fraser, for the excellent speech, and uh, fellow Toastmasters, and fellow guests. Maybe it will be funny, but basically one of the people that really inspired me after looking to the documentary, How McDonald Become McDonald, a person that was not really producing originally. They were not the business, the person was not business owner. He didn't have the deep pockets, but he had a vision. And that person was able to make McDonald's what is McDonald's now, whether we like the product or no, that's a different story. But basically that person become a business leader, directed the, um, the company the way that his vision was and made it successful the way that even he took the ownership of really the McDonald's. And he become the kind of owner and took over that company. So whether we like or no, the person had a vision, was able to successfully direct it to where the vision was and made it a very profitable business. And the way this should be for all engineers. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Ashton. If everyone you'll notice, Luis has backgrounds on his screen. In Toastmasters, we like to keep things timely. We're giving up to two minutes for you to speak. So that means you get a green sign at one minute, 
a yellow sign at 1.30 and a red sign at two minutes. So just keep your eye on that when you're speaking. All right, I'd like to ask our next speaker. Do we have any volunteers? Okay, well, how about I volunteer someone else again? Baba Wally, do you, do you feel comfortable speaking? I've got a question for you. Yeah, why not? <laughs> All right, I love your attitude. All right, the question for you. Do you prefer working in a group or with individual team members? Ah, uh, both. Uh, yeah, because both of them, they have their benefits, right? So um, working uh, in a group, right, gives the opportunity to be able to harness uh, the ideas of other people and to be able to hold back your idea and then listen, grab the other people, what they're trying to put across. And then working in a, an individual groups give the opportunity to be able to uh, show your vision, exercise your vision, and make it happen. But in a group, yeah, yes, it can also happen, but it has to be, it has, there must be enough patience to be able to uh sell the idea sell the to to the other group members so that's just in a short form excellent baba wali thank you for that some very good points all right who else would like to go ooh bentiun got your hand up okay tell us bentiun what is your best leadership skill? Mr. Toastmaster, the best leadership skill has to have three attributes. First, he must be visionary. Second, must be team player. Third, must be um, execute, uh, ex uh, must be able to execute. Now, in a changing world, moving at a lightning speed, we need a paradigm shift. It needs a thought process that is beyond the obvious. And for that, leadership can be a lonely place, but you have to take the, 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 you know, your research, your hard work, and then set your target and vision. Once you set that, target and vision, you devote your time, include, involve all the expertise and knowledge that is around you. Then you train your team, okay? It would be a lonely place. You may be hated. You may not be liked at first, but your vision is where you are going to take us. And that vision has to be really a direction that will set the stage for the purpose that you are standing for, for the objective. In this case, we have to serve society. We have to be professionals. So in, our, in order to do that, you have to execute with full engagement involving climate, environment, technology, science, society, economics together. So you have to have vision, execution, team building, engagement. That is my attribute for leading an organization. And I suggest that is what Raiden should do. Thank you. Oh, excellent, Bentiu. And that was such a well-structured answer too. Do we have any volunteers? Oh, Beulah. Beulah, you have an engineering background and you're into leadership. Would you like, would you like a question, Beulah? Okay. Beulah, your question is, which leadership skill do you need to work on? You did. There you go. Okay. The leadership skill I need to work on would be to keep my focus. I'm hardworking. I can lead by example, put all that in. But often I get distracted. So right now, not just in leadership, but even in my life, that's something I need to work on. 
you may have a good idea, you have limited resources, limited time, but if you're going to get distracted and use some of those resources for something else, you will never get to your goal. You'll never finish it. So I would say having a focus, like laser sharp, laser sharp focus to spirit towards your goal. That would be what I would look for for myself. Excellent. Thank you, Beulah. It's very honest and open. All right, I've got more questions. Who would like to participate? Chris, our, our vice president-elect, would you like to take on a leadership question? I got a real good one for you. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I never say no, so. All right, here we go. All right, Chris, can you tell us what makes leadership difficult? Um, thank you for the question, Darren. And I like to. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight as well. I see a lot of familiar faces. What makes leadership difficult? Um, it's actually said, great leaders don't have a bunch of followers. Great leaders make more leaders. And I think the hardest thing about a leader is actually creating more of those leaders and getting them to be as passionate and visionary as those before them and even beyond. I hope today we have been enlightened a little bit to go through that and evolve as leaders in the new revolutions and industrial revolutions that are to come. So I would say the hardest thing is to not be selfish and to be completely selfless in creating more of those leaders. And the higher you are in leadership, I feel like the more selfless you have to be, the more you must give and that is a, a very hard thing to do in hard times, especially coming out of COVID, especially with inflation and all these other external stressors in our lives. So that would be my answer. Awesome, Chris. That was a great answer. Don't be shy, everyone. Don't be afraid to turn your camera on. I've got a lot. We've got, we still have some more time. Who would like to go next? Dr. Fraser. I know you just spoke for 45 minutes. Can I ask you a leadership question? You can. Okay, Dr. Fraser, how do you ensure your team is committed to their projects? So I, I'm going to start by saying, ensuring how I ensure my team is committed to their projects, um, I'm going to speak about the alternative fuels team. Um, one is by example. Second one is, and by, by, by the way, by example, isn't always light. A second one is by explaining why we're doing something. Okay. Um, getting buy-in, um, finding out um, about each individual, actually working with individuals when necessary um, can be very time consuming. Um, I would say with my team, the, um, biggest thing that's uh, helped me build a very tight team, a very dedicated team and a very cohesive team over many years is simply spending time with them. Now, when you don't spend time with someone, I have discovered it becomes much more difficult. So that's the time side of things. And I can give stories about 37 hour car rides from here to Wyoming with students. But um when you start building other teams, if you don't meet with them often, it becomes very difficult. You essentially are bringing people together who may have different perspectives. If you don't understand those perspectives, you can have a lot of miscommunication. Uh, and I think you got to have generative discussions. And whenever I've seen difficulty, it's because there's been a lack of those generative discussions. So that my my answer is essentially that you got to bring people together and be excellent. Part, you know. Great answer, Dr. Fraser. I'm going to volunteer somebody. Kamaludin. Did I say that properly? Close enough? I've got a question for you. Which approach would you use to deliver positive feedback to a team member?
You're on mute. Is your microphone not working? Okay, we can come back to you. Okay, um, Ravinder, would you like to answer a question, Ravinder? You're on mute, I can't hear you. Read your question, please. Uh, what is your question, please? Okay, you're back. Okay. I said, which approach would you use to deliver positive feedback to a team member? Actually, I uh, take the discussion between the uh, members. We uh, give more uh, importance because whenever we have any uh, problem, then we can uh, discuss among ourselves and take the best uh, decision. And in this way, we, we are able to solve any kind of problem. So I think this is one of the way that the leaders can do in their profession. They, can, they should take care of their, uh, I mean, cognizance of their uh, partners. They should work together and uh, be positive in all respect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin Ravinder, would you like to try? Would you like to try a question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in my opinion, uh, there is a hidden leader in every person or a woman. Okay. It is the time when it is become out of him or her. Nobody alone can change. And in the leadership is a way that creates with the teamwork. And then one can become a leader out of them, of that team that guides his team, then he becomes a leader. Okay. Thank you, Ravinder. That's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, Amity. Did I say that right? Yep. Okay. I've got a question for you. Can you tell us about a time where you mentored another individual Hopefully, hoping that they would become a leader. Yeah, I got a, I did a men mentorship uh, with another engineer, and he was a great, uh, great person to work with. So I trained him um, what to do to become a professional engineer and his success. And he also volunteered some of our bridge building challenge, and that's really rewarding. So. Excellent. Thank you, Amity. I've mentored many engineers myself. It's the most rewarding experience. So yeah, I'd like to thank, thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you to every one of our speakers who participated tonight. This is what we do in Toastmasters. We communicate, leadership, learn how to listen. There's a variety of different skills that we practice. We have some fun together. And if you're interested, please drop us a message in the chat. We meet every week on uh, Tuesdays at the University of Toronto. So I'd like to move the agenda forward and I would like to turn this meeting over to our president, Vice President-elect, Chris Chaheen, to deliver some thanks. Chris. Thank you, Darren. It's my distinct honor to extend thanks and gratitude to PEO President, Dr. Royden Fraser. Thank you for enlightening us today on the leadership vision for the PEO. We appreciate your time your expertise, your perspective, and mentorship in navigating vision. As we learned, vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others. In times of updating our vision, thank you for giving us that sight, Dr. Fraser. 
Further among us today, we have leaders that made this night possible. A profound thank you to Christy Go, Jim Chisholm, Luis Pedrera, Amanda Daly, Ravinder Penasar, Dirin Versami, and those that spoke during the table topics, Afshin, Babawali, Bentilium, Biola, Kemaludin, Ravindra Amiti, and of course, our co-sponsors at Toastmaster Speakers Club of Ryerson Engineering, or SCORE. Thank you to our Toastmasters Toronto Engineering Club of Speakers, TEX, and of course, our PEO chapters, beginning with the West Toronto chapter, the York chapter, East Toronto chapter, Mississauga chapter, Toronto Humber chapter, Kingsway chapter, Oakville chapter, Etobicoke chapter, and the Brampton chapter. Lastly, I'd like to thank you, the viewers. Thank you for being part of the experience tonight. If what you heard today from PEO President-elect Croydon Fraser resonated with you and want to get further involved, take him up on his offer and send him your uh, vision and your background with some context towards that vision. Perhaps you'd like to get further involved and become a volunteer or go to one of these Toastmaster events. I highly encourage you. Alternatively, you can maybe even consider running for PEO elections and be part of that vision-making process. Now, I will pass it on to PEO pres past, pres uh, past Councillor Jim Chisholm. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chris. That was an uh, excellent thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> to give concluding remarks to uh, this session, Ravinder Panasar, who is the regional councillor for the West Central Region, the junior uh, councillor for the West Central Region, uh, will give concluding uh, remarks. Ravinder? Thank you, Jim. It's my pleasure to give and attend this session and pass on my remarks. Uh, I am thankful to Dr. Fraser, who has given a very lucid uh, talk on the evolution of engineering first, how it was developed from civil engineering to other branches, and later on he switched to the regulation of the engineering profession in Ontario, particular and touched something part of the BC also, overall in Canadian history of uh, regulation of engineering profession. He did touch about the power factor, which has revolutioned a little bit for the foreign trade engineers to have their license. That way we can increase the uh, membership of uh, Ontario uh, professional engineers uh, admission over the foreign trade engineers. And I'm thankful for the organization who has arranged this seminar. And first seminar, they have five in series. And definitely this will help in developing or improving the image of profession in Ontario. Regarding the Ontario regulator, it needs to be improved and council is doing its best way to do it. Let's hope that the present president of council, Dr. Fraser, do his best to bring it to the par at per the expectations of the professional engineers of Ontario. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ravinder, that's fantastic. Just before I give uh, closing remarks uh, to end uh, this session, uh, Royden, do you have a last few words to say? Hi, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, I wasn't expecting the last few remarks, but I would just say that um, if you want my vision for the future, it is to develop a vision that involves everyone. To me, that is the, without that, not without knowing where we're going, we're just going to randomly change directions as things come upon us, as problems emerge, and we won't know how to choose between them very reliably or consistently without a vision. 
So I, I believe that is the most essential point of what I'm going to try to do this year as the, the I guess, the front seat, the hot seat of uh, Professional Engineers Ontario's president. And hopefully it uh, results in something that others you know, has wide acceptance and it, others can buy into. And it follows up on what Chris is saying. It can create more leaders if you have that common vision. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Royden. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciated your uh, presentation. Uh, you pointed out how important a vision is, and you pointed out some of the processes to develop it. And as you indicated, it will be a process that involves lots of people. And you have encouraged the audience uh, to actually send in their thoughts about vision to yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic I I idea. And I encourage uh, audience members to do that. Christopher has already thanked the other organizers of uh, this meeting. And uh, there's one person in particular, aside from you, Royden, the speaker, that I'd like to uh, give a shout out to, and that's Christy Gao, who uh, chaired most of this meeting. Uh, one of the people just before this meeting started uh, used the word uh, just amazing and awesome to describe Christy. And she is totally that way. I mean, it's unbelievable how well she organizes things, motivates things, uh, people, and it's just a tremendous leader. So thank you, Christy. So just before I adjourn the meeting, just again, um, to back up what Darren was saying, uh, this meeting was initiated by the Toronto Engineering Club of Speakers uh, based in the uh, University of Toronto and the SCORE bracket TM squared Toastmasters Club. And we do meet every uh, Tuesday. And there will be a survey that comes out at the end of this meeting in the next couple of days. And one of the questions uh, that you can answer is to, uh, you would like to find out more information about text and score. Uh, and you could leave your uh, email address. So look out for that. So again, thank you everybody for coming. And I wish you a good night. Bye bye. Thank you.